Hi all, this is the Make Haven video for the jointer. So the jointer is a great tool for taking rough lumber that is just dried and dressing it, which means taking it from its rough state to what's typically called S4S, which means surfaced on four sides. Um, if you imagine having just a a rough piece of wood that has, you know, that isn't straight, that isn't square. If you're trying to work with it, that could be a real pain. Uh, so S4S means that the two faces are parallel to each other and they're perpendicular to the two sides and hopefully your ends are also squared up as well. Um, so the jointer is the first step in the process of dressing and the, the first step of that is jointing a face. So when you're when you have your piece of wood, and we're going to use this as our, our demonstration piece of wood. This is a face. Um, just to, to recap, cutting a face this way is ripping, cutting it this way is cross-cutting, and this way along the thin edge is resawing. Um, when we're dressing the face, the, the idea behind the jointer is that we have an infeed table which is this one, where the wood is getting pushed in from, and the outfeed table over here. The infeed table is slightly lower than the outfeed table, and the blades are set at the exact same height as the outfeed table. So as the wood comes in, whatever the difference is between the height of the infeed table and the blades is how much wood is gonna get taken off. So if you have a piece of wood that isn't quite flat, that either has a bow to it over the length, or has just undulations over its entire length, then it'll start here, it'll get shaved off, and then it will rest on the outfeed table as you push it out. Um, it may take a few passes, but eventually what will happen is your piece of wood will become flat. So that's the first step in jointing. Then once you have that flat face, you can put that flat face up against this back fence and run an edge along the jointer and that's called edge jointing. Once you've done that a few times, it, it works on the same principle, then you're left with a piece of wood that has a flat face and a flat edge. If you're buying, buying wood from most hardwood lumber yards, um, they will offer to do that for you. So they can, they can dress the wood um, either entirely or just one face and one edge. And the reason they do that is because it, it can be helpful to have big industrial machines or a jointer, which some people may not have, but the reason they would only do two out of those four faces or sides is because once you have that, you can do the rest with other tools. So once you have one flat edge, one dressed edge, you can run it along the fence of a table saw and clean up the other side. And once you have one dressed face, you can run it through the planer with the dressed face down and the planer will clean off the other side. So the jointer is only needed for those first, um, for those first two sides. So that's sort of the role that the jointer plays. Sometimes, or often, it's, it's the very first tool that the wood encounters. Um, maybe the second, after the chop's off, you need to cut it down to length. Um, and that's, uh, that's sort of the, the role it plays in the wood chop. So in terms of some general safety things when we're using it, it is a really big exposed blade spinning really fast with a whole lot of power. Um, so it needs to be treated with the utmost respect. Uh, so no, no cavalier uh, moving your hands around it. Um, you need to be very focused when you're using it. Uh, there, there are some tools that, that require not all of your focus. This requires all of your brain on the tool. Um, and as soon as you get into the motions and get distracted and, and you know, lose your focus, that's when accidents are going to happen. So this blade guard is here to cover the blade when it's spinning but uh, not cutting and it gets pushed out of the way by the wood as, as you push it through and then it's spring-loaded so it, it returns and covers it when you're done. So that's one great safety feature um, and to that point here at Makehaven we never remove the fence um, so that the fence, the fence stays on. Um, I'm sorry, not the fence, the blade guard. So here at Makehaven uh, the blade guard is always going to stay on. Uh, it is very important for covering the blade. Uh, and, and keeping us safe. So that's step one. Um, some of the other reminders I'm going to go through are written up on, um, on the ducting here. So I'll just go through those. The
the minimum jointing dimensions are 12 inches long. If you had a piece of wood that was shorter than 12 inches, um, you, you run the risk of it getting caught in the gap in between, of not being able to keep your hands far enough away from the piece, of it getting caught and twisted. So the minimum length is, is 12 inches. And in general, you're not gonna want to joint anything shorter. There are other tools that can be used for that purpose. Um, in terms of the width, two inches wide is the thinnest, and three-eighths thick is the thinnest uh, thickness that you could use. So any thinner than two inches wide, and you are not gonna be able to get either a great grip if you're face jointing on that top surface, or if you're edge jointing, you're gonna be awfully close to that blade. And then in terms of the thickness of the wood, three-eighths is the minimum, because if you're uh, face jointing any thinner than that, the blocks you're gonna be using risk getting cut in the jointer, and if you're edge jointing any thinner, it, it could be too weak and break, and, and then all that force that you're putting down into the table is putting your hands down into the blade. In terms of the depth of cut, you can imagine that as you increase the depth of cut by dropping the infeed table down, more force is being applied by the blades onto the piece of wood. As a result, a sixteenth of an inch is the maximum depth of cut that we want to make here. And I'll show you how that's indicated in a minute. Um, taking any more can, can be dangerous, and there are certainly times when you want to take less. The only time you would take a sixteenth is in a soft wood that was clear, meaning there are no knots in it, uh, or spots, or checks, or cracks that looks like they may, may give you trouble. Um, and, and so in, in general, I, I take a 32nd of an inch off at a time. That's a, that's a fairly safe amount. And if it's a very hard wood with, with weird stuff going on, you might take off even less just to shave it off. It's, there's no rush, it'll take you slightly longer. It's not a big deal. Um, the max length that we can cut here is about six feet. The reason for that is just because one, the layout of the shop, we have the grizzly bandsaw over on this side that, that helps to limit it. But in general, keeping the, sh the length short or at least not terribly long, is a good idea because if you can imagine if there's a bow in your piece of wood and the back end is not supported by the infeed table over a long distance, then it's just, it's, it's not going to do a great job of taking the bow out of that piece of wood. Um, it's also pretty hard to manage. So if it makes you feel more comfortable within that six foot range, you can set up rollers at the infeed to help support the, the work, um, but you, you don't want to go any longer than that. In general, shorter is going to be better because it's more manageable and you want to be focused here at the blade, you want to be worrying about a piece of wood flopping around. Um, so for face jointing, that is when you're taking a piece of wood and the face is laying down on the blade, you're going to be using the push sticks. So these push sticks are great. On the bottom, they have a grippy material that will help you hold down onto the surface and push it while keeping your fingers protected and well away from the blade. And if it's your rearmost hand, on the bottom are these little um, clips that drop down to catch the back edge of the piece of wood to help feed it through. So you don't ever need to consider having any fingers at the palm of your hand behind the piece of wood. That's, that's what these are for. And they live right down here on the front of the machine. So those, are, those are for face jointing and they are required for, for doing any face jointing. When you're edge jointing, you're not going to be using these push sticks typically. Um, these, those are for pushing down into the table because you want to keep the wood flat while it's going across. When you're doing edge jointing, it's going to be pushed up against the fence. Obviously, gravity and, and some of your force is pushing it down into the blade, but your primary concern is keeping that jointed face up against the fence so you know that your jointing edge is 90 degrees to it. As a result, you're using your hands, but your hands must stay at least six inches away from the blades. So you're gonna start by feeding, and then when it's time to transition, your left hand can move over the blade, well away to the outfeed side. Um, but you don't wanna have your hands, if, if the piece of wood is tall enough, you can have it above the, the, the blade um, on top of your piece of wood, but you wanna give that blade a wide berth when you're, when you're on top of it. Um, sometimes the metal bed that you're sliding the wood on will be a little sticky. And the reason for that is all the wax has gotten rubbed off. If that's the case, then the paste wax lives up on the wall behind the Laguna bandsaw. You can just grab some of the wax, 
uh, with some paper towel and just buff it into the surface. And with another piece of paper towel, just buff it off until it looks like there's nothing there. And that will work wonders for making the wood just glide right across to make the friction on the table a non-issue. Um, we mentioned already that the blade guard is not to be removed. The very last thing is that you want to make sure there's no metal whatsoever in your pieces of wood. Sometimes there's staples or nails. Um, you need to just make sure there's no metal. We have a metal detector up on the wall if you're unsure. Uh, but any metal is going to chip the blades and then every subsequent piece of wood that goes through is going to have a little lump where that piece of metal chipped off the blades. So you need to make sure, just as with the planer, that there's no metal in your piece of wood. So that's how the, the jointer works. Uh, and how it's used, and now we're going to look at some of the, the finer details on it. In terms of adjusting the infeed table, which is going to be probably the most common action, um, there's an indicator here for the depth of cut. So this goes all the way from zero to a half inch, which I can't even fathom ever being used. Uh, so we're going to stay right between zero and, and just those, you know, those first two tick marks, either a 32nd or a 16th of an inch. So to make it possible to move that, we just loosen this, and then the knob down here lets us change that. So as I twist this, we can lower the table, and it does take some, some strength to do that. And then in reverse, it raises it back up. So for now, I'm going to set it at 1 32nd of an inch. So coming back up, and now we are at 1 32nd, and I'm just going to tighten this handle down to make sure that no vibration causes any funny business. So that's one um, important feature. There is a similar knob and, uh, uh, and peg here controlling the movement of the outfeed table. However, the outfeed table is calibrated to be exactly at the height of the blade, which means we rarely if ever want to move this. So in general, that stays fixed. We're just adjusting the infeed table. Now on the back side, there is the controls for the fence. So there are times when you're going to want to adjust the fence. In general, you're going to want it just at 90 degrees. To confirm that it's at 90 degrees, you can grab a tri-square uh, and, and make sure that it is in fact at, at that angle. The importance there is when you're edge jointing, if it's not at 90 degrees, then that edge of your piece of wood is not going to be at 90 degrees to the face, which means if you're trying to do what the jointer is named after, which is joining together two pieces of wood, um, it's not going to come together at 180 degrees necessarily. There are tricks to get around that which we'll get to in a minute. There are some situations where you'd want to change the angle of the fence. The way to do that is by loosening the knob on the back, pulling this pin out which sets it right at zero degrees, and you can change the angle. This handle can, is convenient for, for doing that. Sometimes where you might want to do that is if you wanted to put a chamfer on the edge, of a piece of wood, um, if you wanted to do a mitered butt joint along the length of two pieces of wood. Um, and just, just so I mention this now, you would never use the jointer on, edge on end grain. So it would only be on the edge of a piece of wood. Um, and then you can adjust the, the position this way. So to do that, you just loosen this and then you can pull the whole thing forwards and backwards. Um, in general, we can just leave it at the backmost position to expose as much of the blade as possible as, you know, while it's protected under the blade guard. And we'll just tighten that back down so it isn't moving for anyone else. So those are all of the features on the jointer. It's a fairly simple machine. Um, and now we're going to get into how we actually use it. So now that we're actually getting to um, using the jointer, the, we want to look carefully at our piece of wood to see exactly how we're going to do this. So this is fresh, freshly dried wood. Um, you can see, if you look closely, that it's quite rough. Um, and you can even see the milling marks from the bandsaw in the wood. So it was a, a big, rough saw, and it, and it left these marks across it, which certainly is not what we want on the final product. So one purpose of this is just to smooth it out. The second purpose is to correct any warping that happened when it that happened when it, the wood dried. So, um, as wood dries, there are a few changes that can happen to the wood. It can twist, which is fairly easy to understand. That's when the wood goes like this over its length. It can cup, which is if the wood 
over some part of its length went like that. So instead of being flat, it had some cup to it. Um, and then there's bowing, where over the length it has a, a work this way. So those are, those are some different kinds of things that, that can happen. And depending on those, that, that's gonna determine how we go about using the jointer. So one other consideration is looking actually right at the grain of the wood. So in this case, we can see that it's pretty straight with the wood um, with, with some slight variations. And one consideration could be, especially if you're having trouble with leaving a smooth finish, is that you want to treat grain the same way you would treat um, uh, like a, a dog's hair if you're petting it. You want to go with the grain. So if we're having run out, which is where the grain comes out of the wood this way, then we want the jointer blades to be spinning like this. If they were spinning like this, if we put the board in the other way, then they would be peeling up each layer and leaving a pretty rough surface. So in this case, it's pretty close to being straight with the board. There's some run out, but it, it goes in both directions. So there's no one clear winner in terms of which way we'd want to go. Um, and as I'm looking at it, I don't see any intense warping or twisting or cupping or anything like that. But I'm gonna review just because if there were, you would wanna know how to deal with that. So if there's cupping, which again is if the wood goes like this, then you wanna put it through the jointer so that it's, the wood is supported and is not rocking around. If it's rocking, then you have no way of knowing if your finished product is gonna be flat because it's moving as you're pushing it through. So if it's cupped like this, you put it with that side down. So it's fully supported by the two corners. So those are holding the wood up um, and it's as stable as possible going through. If there is a twist to the wood, you want, well, there's, it's not the orientation that matters so much, it's how you hold it. So you wanna make sure that the twisted piece, the, the part that's twisted down, is pushed firmly against the table so that with each pass through the jointer, you're shaving it down and bringing it all, all flat. Um, twists can be tricky because the wood can have a tendency to rock. So you need to make sure that you are pushing consistently and you may end up pushing very little on the infeed table and mostly on the outfeed table so that you aren't rocking the wood as you're going through. If there is a, uh, a bow over the length of the piece of wood, then you are gonna put it with the bow facing down, same as the cup, because you don't want it rocking over the length of your jointer. Um, however, one consideration is that it's possible if it's an intense bow, that after you go through the blades, it'll dive down and get caught on the outfeed table, which obviously we don't want. So um, if that's the case, then you may consider flipping it over and holding it in such a way that you are, are confident that it's not moving, um, but that you're taking off the, that top side first. Uh, and, then, and then you can put it through the planer to get rid of the tops once that other side is flat. Um, in terms of the edge jointing, which again comes after the face jointing, it's fairly similar. Uh, one big difference is that you can help to fix for that, uh, for the variations in the edge. So let's say there is a large bow over the length of your piece of wood in this direction, then that corner, the, this leading one, could dive down after the blade right in, uh, into the outfeed table. And if it's just a small amount, then the blades can take care of it and it won't be a problem, especially if you're pushing correctly into the fence and not down into the table. Uh, but sometimes if it's severe, you won't be able to. In which case, you can take a straight line, uh, either a chalk line or a, a long st uh, straight edge or, or track, and draw a straight line where you want to cut and take that off on the bandsaw. If you do that, then you know that that edge is close to straight and you can safely pass it through the jointer without problem. So that's um, the, the main considerations when it comes to the piece of wood. There are a few more techniques we'll get to with, with edge jointing in just a minute. So for getting the tool ready, this piece is six feet, which is slightly longer than twice our infeed table, so it won't balance on here, so we'll leave it right here. For turning it on, it's the same card activation. Right now, it uses the table saw to activate it. In the future, it may have its own dedicated card activation.
as with uh, all the tools hooked up to the dust collector, you want to make sure that the gate is open on the tool you're using and not on any of the tools that aren't being used. So in this case, I'll open this and just walk around quickly to make sure that all the other tools are closed. So here we can see that the table saw, both of the, the vents on the table saw, and the gate on the planer is closed, as well as the gate on the floor sweep. Uh, and now that the gate is open on the jointer, we are good to go. So the power button is located down here. I'm just reconfirming that we've set it to a 32nd of an inch. And I'm going to get the push blocks ready for um, to use them. So I'm going to just start with one as I'm pushing. And then as I get close to the end of the board, um, then I'll grab the, grab the second. Just to make sure that this is clear, when you're face jointing, your pressure is going down. This is a heavy piece of oak, so it's doing a good job of holding itself down. But on other lighter woods, potentially, you need to make sure, first on the infeed, that it is flat on the infeed and it's not tilting backwards on you. And then on the outfeed, that it is pushing down the outfeed, because as it comes off, it could tilt off. This extension is slightly lower, so it's not fully supporting the wood. It'll stop it from dropping, but you need, it's, not, it's not totally coplanar with the top of the outfeed table. A second note that doesn't apply to this piece of wood because it is really thick, is you don't want to be bending the wood by pushing so hard down into the table. You're trying to keep it on the surface, but if it has a bow over its length, and then you're squeezing that out by pushing really hard, then you're eliminating the purpose of the jointer because it's just going to thin the piece of wood and when you release pressure it's still going to have that bow. Again, not a problem here, but could be otherwise. So I'm just going to take another pass or two on this to smooth out the face and then we can switch to the edge. And as a note, it's okay to keep the jointer, jointer going between each pass. Same as with the, with the pointer. down. 
Uh, you want to be in a really firm, confident position. There's, there's no room for, for wobbling or, or any funny business like that. Uh, number two, something you may have noticed is that on each pass, I blew off the infeed table to make sure there are no chips on the surface. If there are wood chips underneath the top, uh, underneath your board, then it's no longer flat with the infeed table, so it isn't going to do a good job of, of jointing. So, um, so it's important to, to just do, quickly blow that off before each, uh, before each pass. Um, so those are just some, some tips. So next we're going to move on to edge jointing. When it comes to edge jointing, we again want to make sure that it's ballpark straight-ish. And in this case, this side is just fine. The flip side, not so much. So this is super wavy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by jointing the bottom side. And then once we have that straight edge, I can just run it through the table saw and rip off the, the wavy edge on the other side. Um, it wouldn't be impossible to do this in the jointer. It would just be more time consuming because you're removing it by a 30 second of an inch versus all at once on the table saw. So that's the thought. The second technique uh, is the fence is very close to being perpendicular with the outfeed table and the infeed table, but it's not perfect. And if you're trying to get two boards to come together perfectly and have a, a, a nice glue joint that is going to be practically invisible, then you really need them to come together quite close. So uh, the way we do that is if you have your two boards and they're next to each other, you want to alternate the sides that are facing the fence. So that does is if there's any angle offset from 90 degrees, then when you put your boards together, they complement each other. So if one is slightly angled this way, and then, then the other one, once you flipped it over, is going to be slightly angled this way, and they'll come together perfectly right at the edge. Uh, if you don't think to do that, then your boards, however you've aligned them, may not uh, come together perfectly. They may either have a crack, or, or if you put them together the other way, they, if you push them together, there will be an angle to them. Um, that mostly matters only if you're really concerned with the grain orientation. Otherwise, you could just flip the board over when you're done, and then they'll match up. So that's the one tip on edge jointing. So we'll get to that now. Again, we won't be using the push sticks for this, so we'll be using hands, which means that we've been keeping them well away from the blade. take another pass or two to get it all down to perfectly flat. Um, and just, just to reiterate, what you're trying to do when you're feeding wood through is your edge jointing is pushing as hard as possible into the fence, not into the table. Gravity will take care of that. But you want to make sure that your, the, the face that you've just recently jointed is pushed up into the fence to make sure that it's 90 degrees to the bottom. So I'll take a few more passes.
So when you're jointing, uh, similar to on the planer, you can hear how, wh when the blade is engaged and how hard it's working. Um, in this case, from the get-go, you could hear that the front edge was not hitting um, for a while. So it, it would hit the middle and take off wood in the middle, but it took a few passes until we could hear it biting. And as soon as you can hear it biting on this edge, then you know it's ready. So as we flip it over, we can see that the whole length of this board is jointed. Uh, it should be about as, as straight as can be now from one end to the other. Um, let's say you have an end that dipped way down, then you wouldn't need to take off all the wood in the middle uh, just to get down to that. If you wanted, you could take the rest off on the table saw now that you have this straight edge, um, or you could just cut your board down. Uh, in this case, it wasn't too much wood just to get it flat along the length, so I took a few more passes to get it totally straight. Um, so that is the, the basic information for using the jointer. Um, right now we have jointed a face and an edge, so now we can take it to the table saw to rip the other edge and to the planer to flatten the other face. In terms of cleanup, it is connected to the dust collector, but uh, dust still manages to come out the back and on the, on the top. So just make sure to grab the vacuum and vacuum up when you're done. Thanks for watching.